hopeful sermon. Um, we'll get that next week from the elders. We're going to have a... Uh, but, uh, but this... this I, I want to... In a way, there's an optimism to this, but I want to begin, or rather close out the year, where the word about God ruining our lives. Because He just flat does. And it's just what God does. When He comes into a life, He begins almost immediately to spoil it. I want to start the a sermon with, with a word from a friend of mine, a friend named Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who died several years before he was born, executed by Hitler. Not Hitler didn't hold the gun, but he, he died because of the plot that he was a part of against Hitler. And this is a word from one of his sermons that every time I read it, I'm like, yes, I know that feeling. See if, see if you feel it with me. Dietrich says, if you once let God into your life, if you once allow yourself to be enticed by God, you will never get away again. As a child never gets away from its mother, as a man never gets away from the woman he loves. Do you see what he did there? You can't escape, but it's partly because you don't want to. Little kids don't want to get away from their mother. It's the only place they feel safe, and yet you're always there, right? You're always There's this sense in which we're stuck with him. The person to whom God has once spoken can never forget him entirely but will always know that God is near in good times and in bad, that God pursues him as close as one's shadow. Now, as long as God doesn't expect anything from you, that's not hard. That can even be really good. I want him to be as close as my shadow to save me, to do the God job that he's got. He's supposed to make my life good for me. That isn't what he does. This constant nearness of God becomes too much, too big for the person who sometimes think, oh, if only I had never started walking with God. It is too heavy for me. It destroys my soul's peace and my happiness. What is he talking about? Well, as long as you're walking with God and things are easy, that's not true. But have one enemy. One moment where God expects you to love somebody you don't want to, and He will hound you to death about it. Have one trouble that you need to forget and can't. Have one moment come into your life where you have to, you have to do the right thing when you want to do the wrong thing. And He is just there, like the shadow over our lives. And He's so big and so heavy and so relentless and so won't go away. You know what He's talking about? Have you felt this? But these thoughts are of no use. One cannot go get away. One must simply keep going forward with God, come what may. And it can be so heavy, Bonhoeffer has these next thought. If, if someone were to think he can no longer bear it and must make an end of things, then he realizes that not even this is a way of escape from the presence of God, whom he has allowed into his life, by whom he has been enticed. We remain at God's mercy. We remain in God's hands. Do you understand that feeling? If discipleship is rubbing against you any hard part in your life, you probably get that. This comes from a sermon that Bonhoeffer preached in London in the 1940s. And the text of his sermon is the text of my sermon today from Jeremiah chapter 20, where the prophet complains about God's call into his life. Immediately before the words we have right here, Jeremiah has spent a lovely time in stocks because of his prophecy. He's been abused and mistreated by a king. And so he complains to the Lord God, O oh Lord, you have deceived me, and I was deceived. You are stronger than I, and you have prevailed. I have become a laughing stock all the day, and everyone mocks me. And realize, that's not hyperbole. He's describing the experience he just went through. People making fun of him, throwing rotten eggs and tomatoes at him because of the word of the Lord God that he had to proclaim against the king. He says, for whenever I speak, I cry out violence and destruction. Why does he do that? Because that's what God's telling him to do. All the other prophets that people hire are there saying, hey, don't worry, God's not going to let anything bad happen to us. It's all going to be okay. 
And boy, don't you want a preacher to get up and tell you that? Don't worry, it's all going to be all right. Everything's going to be okay. God's with you. God is on your side. God is rooting for everything about you. And God wants you to always win. And God wants you to succeed. And you ought to get rich. And everything ought to be well and good in your life. And you ever sit there and look at it and go, well, if that's true, then why is it like this? No, the real prophet that comes has to shout violence, destruction, bad news, messages you don't want to hear. Things aren't going great. It's going to be trouble. And so he's got to do that all the time. For the Lord of the word of the Lord has become for me a reproach and a derision all day long. What's he talking about? When I go out and I say this stuff and I tell the truth about what God has told me and I say it, when I live God's way, everybody hates me. It's awful. I don't like it. You've ruined my life, God. Coming near to you has ruined me. He says, and if I say, well, I just won't mention him or speak in his name, then there is in my heart, as it were, a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I'm weary of holding it in, and I cannot. You begin to hear echoes of what Bonhoeffer was saying. If you let God in, He just won't leave you alone. He sets your insides on fire for the sake of holiness. And He calls you into His goodness and His truth. Well, that's just Bonhoeffer and Jeremiah. Really? You think so? Let's take a walk through the Bible. Will you come with me? Let's, let's have a look at a, just, just a few lives. Okay, so let's start with, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot, I already covered this, but I got this slide. <laughs> when God enters life, he immediately begins to ruin it. Now, I want you to understand, when I say he ruins your life, I mean he ruins the life that you think you want. He will flat do that. He'll step to your priorities and go, <laughs> oh, buddy, you don't know. Understand that God never ruins anything good. We often underestimate just how broken and sin-drenched we really are. And what we want is God to come into my life and join my priorities. That's not the way the covenant works. The way it works is I let God into my life, and then He calls me to His priorities. You know, because my priorities are not love my enemies, pray for those who persecute you. That's not where I am, at least it wasn't. Well, I started walking with him. The deal is he comes into what is already ruined, and he says, yeah, you can't have that anymore. I'm not going to let you be satisfied with less than goodness. I'm not going to let you be content with your brokenness and the ruination of what you will do if you keep going your direction. And he always does it. As I said, let's take a walk through the Scripture. Let's see. This is what he does. This is just what God always does. I've got, I don't know, seven or ten examples, but I could have pulled a whole lot more, folks. Let's start at the very beginning, all right, with Abraham. In the ancient world, nobody left family. You didn't do that. It wasn't safe, and it wasn't normal. You live out your days in your family compound. And if you were a a nomadic family, the way that Abraham's family seems to have been, even before he was called into that life of wandering, you still stayed with your father's tent. Because that's where your community was. It's where your life was. It was the people who knew you. You don't leave. But Abraham did, and immediately sets off into the Negev. The desert with a wasteland with no waters. Why? Because God immediately calls him out of the life he knew and into death. Because if you can trust God there, you can trust him anywhere. And from the Negev into the promised land. But nobody does this. This ruined this man's life. Or then there's Moses, who kind of ruined his own life first by committing a murder. You know, he decided, hey, I'm going to rescue my people. And he kills a dude, and he ends up having to run off into Midian. And he lives there for like 40 years. He built a good life there. Now, it wasn't the life of a prince, but it was a new life, and it was his. And he was settled into it, and I'm quite certain he was very content. And then he ran into the blazing bush that wouldn't burn up. And that life ended. And another one started. 
He was compelled back into service and sent back to risk his life with Pharaoh, who for whom he's got a warrant sworn out for his death. I mean, he's 40 years, but what's the statute of limitations on murder? Right? So back he goes, and then he comes into, to face a spiritual war with the world hegemon to take on Egypt, the most powerful empire in the world that the world had ever seen, and to fight with his God against their gods and to overcome them. And then the great reward he gets for that is to bear the unbearable burden of a rebellious and hateful people who did not love him very much and then then just all of the mess and a lifetime spent wandering in the desert never getting to go to the home that he had promised to the people congratulations Moses you let God into your life might have been better to keep walking when you saw the bush huh or consider Isaiah Isaiah's call is just this amazing story of exactly what I'm talking about. So Isaiah is there grieving in the temple. His friend Isaiah has died. And, and in the year of the, the king Isaiah died, I was in the temple. And he catches a vision of the Lord. High and lifted up, and the train of his robe fills the temple. And there are all these strange creatures flying around, and they're crying out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. And whenever they cried out, the thresholds of the temple shook. This is a terrifying, wonderful, terrifying vision. And he cries out, Woe to me, I'm undone, for I'm a man of unclean lips. And the angel goes and gets the tong uh, and, and picks up a coal from the altar and takes it and touches his mouth. Because that's fun. And then he says, no, no i got to send some of these people. And Isaiah, you know, goes, ow, no. <laughs> he says, here am I, send me. And he says, all right, let me tell you what your mission is. Go to these people and say to them, you're, you're not going to listen. You're not going to see. You're not going to turn. Because if you would, I would heal you. But you're not going to do any of that. Basically, he's commissioned into a ministry of failure from beginning to end. No success for you, Isaiah. You're going to be miserable your entire time preaching to people who will hear you, but they won't hear, and they won't listen, and they won't change, and their stubborn hearts will never come around. Now go do that. He says, how long do I got to do that? He says, until the land is empty and without inhabitants. Now go. Yay! You begin to understand what Jeremiah is talking about when he says that you've enticed me. You know, and just things are hard now and I'm uncomfortable all the time. And I could give you example after example. All Ezekiel wanted was to be a priest in the homeland. He studied his whole life. He was finally ready to start service when captivity came. And instead of getting to be a priest in the temple, he gets to be a weird, weird prophet in a foreign land. Seeing bizarre and unthinkable visions and having to communicate that junk. All Daniel wanted was to be a good man, a spiritual man, and all he wanted was to pray and God saw to it that he was with the lions. All Daniel's three friends, don't try to pronounce their Jewish names, but it's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. All those guys wanted was was to be faithful. They didn't want to be fuel for a furnace. It happens over and over and over again. Jonah, he just didn't want to preach to his enemies. He wanted to be allowed to hate people. That's, I mean, come on, God, get with my priorities here. I don't like Nineveh. I don't want to go to Nineveh. So let's do this together, and I'm going to go to Tarshish. And he said, No, you're not. We know how that turned out for him. Try to rebel against God. Listen, don't do that. Don't do that. You'll end up eaten by a fish, or worse. You can't get away. He he never lets go. He's relentless. Nehemiah had a great job. Do you know that? Cupbearer to the king, that's like vizier. I mean, super important job. Great job, stable, protected, no one to threaten him at all. And God comes to him. He's got to leave all of that for a life doing a construction project under hostile circumstances where people are trying to kill him. Congratulations. You let him get near. 
Or, you know, then there's this story that we spent all that time talking about for the last month. We watched videos about it if you came for class. You remember this story? You might recall it. It's kind of important. You know, where, you know, the angel comes to Mary. You know, you know, you favored among women. Congratulations, you're going to have them. Didn't go to Joseph, though. You'd think that, you know, that would have been a nice thing to do, right? To go to him before he has to go through the whole mess of, well, I guess I have to divorce my wife because she's done this awful thing. That would have been nice, huh? No, it's, it's afterwards that Joseph finally gets the dream. Why is he doing that? This is what God does. You know, or, you know, if this has been planned, for, this, is, this is just crazy. You know, we had to move once in, in 2008 with a three-month-old baby. That was hard. That was really hard. Can you imagine moving nine months pregnant? This thing's been planned for thousands of years. There's been prophets all over the place. He's sovereign and in control of everything, and he can't arrange for the census to get bumped ahead another couple of years. It's got to be now? Really? Or if this thing has been planned for 2,000 years, what, he doesn't have Priceline? He can't arrange for them to have a room ahead of time? Is the king of kings getting born into the world? Why has it got to be in a barn? What is the deal? God, why is it like this? And that's not the end of the story either because that story has to be told by people who have to have their lives ruined because Peter, he, was, he had a good family business. His dad was a fisherman, probably his dad before him. He had a boat, for goodness sakes. He was doing well in life until Jesus turned up. Flipped everything over on him. Paul was probably going to have a seat on the Sanhedrin. He was being groomed for the Supreme Court of Israel. He was going to be an important mover and shaker until the Damascus vision. And what he wasn't going to do is get beaten all the time and thrown in jail all the time and, and shipwrecked at sea over and over again. Spent three nights floating on a board. Welcome to God. Why is it like this? I mean, like I said, I could have continued showing you these pictures from the Scriptures. I, I think that's probably enough. Do you begin to see that God, when He steps into a life, He doesn't make it rosy and comfortable? You know? God came to Johnny Bag of Donuts and He lived happily ever after, said no one ever. That's not the way it works. And in fact, the closer you get to God, the more likely it is that everything's going to get flipped upside down. Why? Why can't He just come and make me rich? Why can't He just come and make me healthy? Why can't He just come and join with my priorities? I mean, He's... Okay, look, here's the way it's supposed to work. You're a divinity, and I'm your creature, and you're supposed to bless. What's with this mess? You realize that he's trying to shatter that for you? Throughout the scriptures, God is trying to tell you this is not the way it's going to be. It's not going to be like that. The reason it's like this with all these prominent people is because it's really like this with every person. You get close to God, and God's priorities begin to take over. I heard the, have you ever heard this old saw? God is less concerned with our happiness than He is with our holiness. And God just doesn't consider it our job to make His job to make us happy, to arrange things so we can be content. There's a part of me that likes that, but I got to be honest with you. There's a part of me that doesn't because it kind of makes God a jerk, doesn't it? You know, like God's like, well, I don't care whether you're happy or not. Is that the God we serve? Is that Jesus? Is that what He's like? Actually, I think there's some truth in this, but I don't think it's the whole truth. I think there's a bigger truth here. A bigger thing going on in the Scriptures. I've already alluded to it. When God comes to us, He comes to fallen, broken beings. You and I don't like to look at ourselves that way. But that's what we are. The clay is broken. Okay? 
You've heard the old thing, when, when they made you, they broke the mold. When God made you, the devil broke you. Mold's still fine. We're the mess. Sin is just all over us. And as we walk with God that is being changed, but how does He change it? Because this is what eating of the garden, eating of the fruit of good and evil did to us. It turned our hearts in on themselves. We became selfish creatures. We were not designed to know our own good and evil. But that's what we are now. Anything that looks like a good for me, I'm going to go get it. Even if I have to destroy other people to do it. If I'm left to my own sinful self, I will hurt anybody to get my good. And if I feel threatened by something, if it's a danger to me, look out. I'm either going to run away or I'm going to attack. And the I I'm talking about there is the Adam within me, within all of us. We are like that. We love those who love us. We, we really enjoy anything that gives us pleasure and we'll pursue that good as far as we can go. But you expect something of me? Oh man, I don't know. And if it seems like a threat, that's the broken condition. And coming to know Jesus reveals it. Now it transforms it too. We are changed from one degree of glory into another throughout our lives in a process. But we have to keep in mind this mess stays with us as long as breath does. And what we're meant to become is something else. Because God is so fundamentally different from you and me that we can't even begin really, I think, to entirely grasp it. Because at the center of who He is is self-gift. The Trinity lives in continuous, perpetual gift to one another. That's what's always been going on. The Father loves the Son with everything that He is, bringing Him constantly into existence without beginning, without end, always loving His Son, always begetting His Son, always producing His Son. And the Spirit proceeds from the both of them into this bond of love that wraps around them and through them in this beautiful dance of continuous self-gift. That is our God so different from us. There's not one bit of Him that's selfish. Not one bit. But we still are. So God ruins what's already ruined in order to redeem and make us like Himself. He wants to get us from there to there. He intends to move us from where we are to where we will be. And that is why this haunting presence is always there messing up every selfish impulse in us. Every time we want our lives to be about Him, you can expect Him to flip it over and make a mess out of it. Every time we don't want to do the good and godly thing, you can expect Him to nag. But He also makes a mess of anything that would help us to set our priorities here. He flips it all over. He moves it constantly away from self and towards others and towards Him. So that we might become beautiful. Because the broken, sinful creature is not beautiful. Just meet one of them. Look at a mirror. Look at your worst moments. Are they pretty? And you look at your best. Don't they reflect God? God is calling us from what we would be into what we can only become in His hands. And so He changes us. And the truth is we cannot and will not make that move if we are comfortable. That's why He haunted Jeremiah. That's why He haunts every faithful person. Left to myself, I will make my life about here. Getting what I want being satisfied, being, you know, comfortable, being content, being, okay, that's, that's what I want. I don't have to be rich. I just want to be well enough off that I don't hurt. I don't have to be, you know, I don't have to have luxury all the time. Just let me have enough food. I'm going to make it all about that. Everything in me will be about that. And so what the Lord does is He comes to that and He says, yeah, I'm going to mess that up for you. I'm going to wreck that. He ruins us. He comes to us and He compels us to love our enemies and, and to forgive and pray for our abusers. And He expects us to do that. And when we won't, He haunts. 
He hangs over us like a shadow. But it's not Him that's shadow, it's us. And He's calling us into the light. He makes us give to those in need what we would keep for ourselves. And He makes us be lives that are lived for other people. And until we do that, we will feel ruined by Him. But when we do, we find what He's always been about. We find our way back home. We find the work of God inside of us. And look at what He does. Every single one of those lives that I talked about that were ruined, look at what they became. They became amazing, beautiful people. Abraham became the father of nations. Moses became the redeemer of Israel. Isaiah became the prophet of the Holy One. Jeremiah became the faithful prophet and a faithless Israel. Ezekiel became the prophet to the exiles. Daniel became the faithful dignitary. Jonah, quite against his will, became Nineveh's savior. Nehemiah became the rebuilder of God's nation. Mary and Joseph became parents of God Himself. And Peter and Paul became missionaries of God's gospel. And every single thing that they got was better than they, what they would have had had they not walked with God. He ruins our lives so that He can save them. Now, here's, here's the big hard lesson. One that I need, maybe more than you, I don't know. I am resistant to God's ruination. I continue to want what I want. Now, when I wake up or when I'm close to Jesus, when I'm near to Him, I'm not at all resistant because I know what He is and I know what I want. I want Him more than I want anything else. But in times of crisis, there is this huge chunk in me that goes, oh, oh no. I understand what Bonhoeffer is talking about, do you? I just want to get away. I just want a moment to myself. I just don't want to do that because it's hard and it's shameful and embarrassing. And I, I don't want to be that person. Can't I just be happy? He says, no, not that way. You never will be. But you come with me and I'll give you a joy that you can't imagine if you stay in that. Come with me. Let me ruin that for you. I have better things for you than you can imagine. This is our God. This burning fire inside your bones. The temptation is to quench it as much as you can so you don't have to feel that pain. Well, let me tell you, as 2019 begins, may there be pain in your bones. May God's presence be a fire that burns inside of you that you cannot ignore. May He take hold of your life more deeply than He already has and ruin every ruinous thing. May He enter more deeply into you and ruin what is yet to be remade. May you cooperate with Him. Because that's just the way to real life. How are you doing with this? Do you look into your heart and you look at your priorities, you look at what's going on, you look at your miseries and your sorrows, your joys, the things that you want, but maybe you shouldn't. You look at it. Are you doing okay? Because it's God who saves you, and if you need to be remade, come near to Him. There's room right here. We will pray for you. If you came to this place this morning, you're carrying a burden that's got nothing to do with what I've talked about, but you need the prayers of the saints. Let us know we want to pray for you. And as I said at the beginning, there's no better way of life than following Jesus Christ our Lord. And if you haven't begun yet, today is the day to do it. If this morning you're subject to the invitation of God, would you come right now while we stand and sing? Sweet